911. What is your emergency? Yeah, hi. Um, this is going to sound kind of strange, but there's a man stumbling around in circles in my front yard. Uh, could you repeat that, sir? He looks sick or lost or drunk or something. I just woke up to get a glass of water and heard snow crunching around underneath my front window, so I peeked out. I'm looking at him now. He's about ten yards away from my window. Something's not right. What is your address, sir? 1617 Quarry Lane in Pinella Pass. I'm going to send a squad car your way, but that's quite a ways out. Are you alone in your house, sir? Yes, I'm alone. Can you confirm that all of your doors and windows are locked? Stay on the phone with me. I know that my front is definitely locked, but I'll go check my back door again really quick. I appreciate your help, by the way. I know this is kind of strange, but I really hope that... Uh, sir? Are you still there? He's... he's still in the yard, but he's... what the fuck? He's upside down. Sir, stay on with me. What is happening? He's staring right at me, but he's... he's standing on his hands now. He's perfectly still. Staring straight at me. He's doing a handstand and he's smiling at me and not moving. He's... he's doing a handstand, sir. I... I don't know how he... Yeah, he's facing me and standing on his hands and he's got this huge smile and he's perfectly still... What the fuck? Please get someone out here now. Sir, I need you to remain calm. I've put out the call and an officer is on his way. His teeth are so huge. What the fuck? Please help me. Sir, I want you to try and keep an eye on him, but make sure your back door is locked again. We need to make sure all possible access points are secured. Can you talk me through and confirm that your back door is locked? Okay. I'm walking backwards now and keeping him in my sight. My hand is on the back doorknob now. It's locked. I need to check the deadbolt, so I'm going to take my eyes off of him for a split second. All right, sir. Help is on the way. Just stay on the phone with me. Everything's going to be all right. Sir? Sir? Are you still there? He's... his face. It's up against the glass. Sir, I need you to speak up. What is happening? I looked away for a split second and now... His face. It's pressed up against my front window. His teeth are huge and he's still smiling. There's no color in his eyes. Jesus, please help me. Why won't it just fucking move? Sir, I need you to go to the nearest room and lock yourself inside of it. Do you have a basement or a bedroom that you can lock yourself in? He won't stop staring. He's going to hurt me. Sir, I need you to listen to me. Lock yourself somewhere safe until the officer arrives at your house. Can you hear me? I... yes, yes, I'm going to lock myself in my room. And you're positive that you're alone in your house, correct? Yes, I'm alone in the house. Wait a moment. He's moving. He's shaking his head. He's telling me no. He can hear us. He's telling me I'm not alone. Sir? Sir, are you still there? I heard a loud noise. Is everything all right? Sir? When I reached my car this morning in the apartment complex parking lot, I noticed a white 3 kung 5 inch note card taped to my steering wheel. I was confused how it got there since I was OCD about locking my car at all times. I unlocked the car and sat in the driver's seat to better read the note. In black cursive writing, the note read, Take an alternative route to work this morning. I stared at the note card for a good minute, trying to process how in the hell it would have gotten there. After letting my thoughts run wild, I tossed the note card into the passenger seat. I started driving my usual route to work, thinking this was some kind of joke. As I waited at the red light to turn onto the highway, I picked back up the note card and stared at the message again. In a manner aimed more towards speaking to myself, I blurted the words out. Why the hell would I take a different route to work that would make it almost a 45-minute drive? Realizing I was talking to a note card, I looked at myself in my rearview mirror and laughed. The note card slipped out of my hand and fell on its reverse side onto my lap. Another note was written on the back side that stated, There will be a shooting at the red light after you get off the highway exit ramp. You will be shot if you take that route. I felt a sickening knot in my stomach after reading. I flinched once I heard the car honk behind me. 
irritated by my distraction from the light which turned green. I stepped on the gas and you turned away from the highway exit, almost causing a wreck as I did so. I took the long way to work and arrived about 20 minutes late. My boss, Butch, called me to his office the second I walked through the front door. I still had the note card in my hand and quickly folded it in half, shoving it into my back pocket. Why the hell were you late? Butch said. I just had a rough morning and I had to take the back roads to get here, I said. Son, you're full of nothing but excuses. This is why I am passing you up for promotion. I can't have a senior manger working under me that can't take responsibility for the little things he screws up, said Butch. But sir, I have the highest performance numbers of any other manager here in this building. You have nobody else here that has brought this company as much money as me, I said with passionate anger. Results driven? Yes, you are, but dependable? After this morning's late instance, I just don't see you as a fit for a senior manager. I need someone who is consistent. You can leave the office now. This conversation is over. I stormed out of the office and walked back to my car so I could just be alone and cool myself down. Still pissed off, I grabbed the folded note card from my back pocket. I shouted out loud in my car at the note card. Stupid magic note card. Does Butch just not like me or something? Why would he pass me up knowing I'm the best performer? This was the only time I have ever been late. I yelled with veins pumping in my head. I opened the folded note card, my anger quickly turning to shock once I saw a longer message this time. The message was written in the same cursive writing. Butch passed you up for promotion because he is having an affair with one of your co-workers. He was looking for a reason to downplay your hard work. He will announce her promotion tomorrow morning. The anger came back into my flushed red cheeks after reading. For a minute, I seemingly forgot about the metaphysical anomaly I was experiencing with a magic note card that was answering all my questions. Instead, my anger got the best of me, filling me with thoughts of going back into the office and beating Butch over the head with whatever I could find. Remembering that the note card answered my question this morning with a continued note on its reverse side, I yelled out loud how Butch could just get away with that and if I had any shot of promotion in that company. I flipped the note card over and saw the answer to my question. The note read, He will commit suicide in two weeks. Before that, he will take the life of your co-worker he is sleeping with. She gave him HIV. There will be two open positions as a result, both of which you will be able to apply to. I sat in silence reading the note over and over, feeling disturbed and uneasy. I wasn't supposed to know this. It felt pervasive and wrong to have access to this kind of information. I decided I needed to just go home and drove off, folding the note card and putting it back in my pocket. I noticed police cars as I turned into the ramp leading to the highway. Several cars were littered with bullet holes. Still sitting at my computer, I pulled out the note card and folded it in half again. I asked it who put the note card on my steering wheel. I took a long sip of my whiskey before I opened the note card and read the words that followed. It likes to go by the name Truth. The words on the letter said. I asked the note card, is Truth a person? Before flipping it around to the other side. Truth is not a person. The words said on the card. What exactly does truth look like? I asked the card, turning it around immediately to the other side. Truth has six legs and four arms. It has no eyes, eight ears, and fifteen mouths covering its body with sharp teeth. My eyes went wide as I read the description in fancy black cursive writing. Fear tickled my senses, causing the hairs on my neck to stand up. I asked the card the two dreaded thoughts on my mind. What does it want from me? Why did it give me this note card? I said out loud and slowly turned the note card over to read the backside. It wants you to ask it that question yourself. It's standing right behind you. I dropped the note card after reading, but I dared not move. I just sat staring straight ahead into my computer. I didn't want to see this ugly truth standing right behind me. A few moments later, I heard somebody opening my front door. Baby, we really need to talk. I heard my girlfriend shout from the kitchen. 
I forgot I had given her a key to my apartment. Don't come back here, please just leave, I shouted, hoping she would save herself from the sight of this grotesque thing behind me. I heard my girlfriend's footsteps getting louder and louder coming towards the office room I was in. What the hell has gotten into you? What are you... Her voice cut off suddenly as it reached the doorway. It's been three hours since I heard her voice. I am still sitting at my computer not daring to look behind me. I have kept the brightness on my screen turned up to avoid seeing any glimpse or reflection of the thing behind me. I don't know if my girlfriend is still standing at the doorway, or if that thing did something with her. I have about half a bottle of whiskey left. I am posting this hoping anyone can give me an idea of what the hell will happen when I turn around. I decided as soon as the whiskey runs out, I will finally turn around. The description alone from the note card has me scared shitless to face it. But eventually I will have no choice but to face the ugly truth. You are home alone, and you hear on the news about the profile of a murderer who is on the loose. You look out the sliding glass doors to your backyard, and you notice a man standing out in the snow. He fits the profile of the murderer exactly, and he is smiling at you. You gulp, picking up the phone to your right and dialing 911. You look back out the glass as you press the phone to your ear, and notice he is much closer to you now. You then drop the phone in shock. There are no footprints in the snow. It was the 2nd of January, 2.04 a.m. I woke up to a knocking on the door. One knock every three seconds. I slipped on my slippers and walked down the stairs. As I walked down, the knocking on the door got faster. Almost like a heartbeat. When I got to the door, the knocking stopped. I looked outside and nobody was there. I went back up to my room and went back to bed, thinking it was just some kids playing a prank. At 4.21 a.m., I woke up to the front door slamming shut. I jumped, terrified. I looked over at my frosted window to find smile written all over it in the frost. I grabbed my phone next to me, ready to call 911, only to find a message written on it saying, I told you to smile. I cried and ran for my life running outside. As soon as I got outside, I knocked on my neighbor's house across the road. They answered and held me while I sobbed. They phoned the police. At exactly 5.42, the police came to my neighbor's house after an extensive search of my house. They told me there had been no evidence at all of anyone in my house other than me. The messages on the window were gone, same with my phone. They told me to get some sleep and advised me to see the doctor about stress and anxiety problems. Fuck that. I knew what happened to me was real. The following evening, after spending the day at my neighbor's, I went home. I went up to my bedroom and set up a camera. It was aimed at my bedroom door and my bed. I set it to record and went to sleep. Thankfully, I slept through the night. However, as I watched the footage, I couldn't believe what I saw. At three in the morning, something crawled out from under my bed. It was a completely naked anorexic man. He stood up and looked at me on the bed. He did so for another hour, not moving at all. Then he moved. He walked over to the camera until his face took up the whole shot. He was extremely pale and had bulging veins all over his head. His eyes were completely black with a huge smile on his face. He stared at the camera for another two hours, not blinking, just slightly twisting his head every now and again. After two hours of him staring went past, he walked back over to my bed and crawled back under. I skipped the video forward until it showed me getting up and walking over to the camera. The video finished. I was frozen with fear. The video showed him going back under, but not leaving. Whatever it was, it was still there.
Well, once again, you guys have blown me away with your staggering amount of responses to my stories. There's no way I can respond to each of you individually. So I'm just going to address some common things again, and then move on to the stories. I'm going to write as many as I can think of, in addition to my friends' stories, and I will probably not update again until I get a chance to answer some questions that I have for my superiors. All right, so the common questions I found you all had. I am not comfortable talking about where exactly I work, unfortunately. In all reality, some of the things I've mentioned here could get me in a lot of trouble or fired. So it's best if I just don't discuss too much. I will say that I'm in the United States, and in an area that is comprised of a great deal of wilderness. We're talking hundreds of miles of thick forest, with a mountain range, and a few lakes. There is still a great amount of interest in the stairs, and luckily for you guys, my friend has a story that I think you'll all be very interested in. I'll go into that more at the end of this update. As for whether or not I have ever thought of asking my superiors about them, I have. But again, I don't want to risk my job. However, one of my former superiors no longer works as an search and rescue officer, and it's possible that he may be willing to talk to me about it. I'll be speaking to him later in the week, and I will let you all know what comes of that. As far as advice on becoming an search and rescue officer goes, I think the best advice I can give is to contact your local Forest Service office and see if they offer in training courses or what the qualifications are. I've been doing this for years, and I started out as a volunteer helping on search and rescue operations. It's a great job despite the occasional tragic situations, and I wouldn't want to do anything else. All right, let's move on to the stories. The first happened on a case that I went out on right after I got out of training, and was still pretty new to everything. Before I took this job, I was a volunteer, so I had a basic idea of what to expect, but on those calls you're mostly dealing with finding lost people after vets have found signs of them. As in search and rescue officer, you go out for all kinds of cases, from animal bites to heart attacks. This case got called in early in the morning from a young couple who were up on one of the trails that goes by the lake. The husband was completely hysterical, and we couldn't really figure out what was going on. We could hear the woman screaming in the background, and he was begging us to come up there right away. When we get there, we see him holding his wife, and she's got something in her arms. She's screaming these awful, almost animal-like screams, and he's sobbing. He sees us, and he screams at us to help them, to please get an ambulance up there. Now, obviously, we can't just drive an ambulance up the walking path, so we ask him if his wife needs help, or if she can walk on her own. He's still hysterical but he manages to tell us that it's not his wife that needs help. I go over while one of the vets tries to calm him down, and I ask the wife what's going on. She's rocking, holding something, and just shrieking, over and over. I crouch down and see that whatever she's holding, it's covering her with blood. That's when I notice the sling on her front and my heart sinks. I ask her to tell me what's going on, and I sort of pry her arms gently open so I can see what she's holding. It's her baby, obviously dead. His head is caved in on one side and he's covered in scratches. Now I've seen dead bodies before, but something about this whole situation hits me hard. I have to take a second to compose myself, and I get up and go get one of the other vets who's standing by. I tell him that it's a dead kid, and he sort of pats my shoulder and tells me he'll deal with it. It took us over an hour to get this woman to let us see her kid. Every time we try to take him from her, she flips out and tells us we can't have him, that he'll be okay if we just leave her alone and let her help him. But eventually, one of the vets manages to calm her down, and she gives us the body. We took it back to the med area, but when the EMTs showed up, they told us that there was never any hope of saving the kid. He died instantly from the trauma to his head. I was good buddies with one of the nurses who met them at the hospital, and she told me later what had happened. Turns out the couple had been walking with the baby in the sling, and they stopped because the kid was fussing. The dad takes the kid and is holding him, looking out over this little gully by the path. The mom comes to stand next to him, 
but she ends up stepping on a loose patch of soil, and she trips. She falls into the dad, who drops the kid, who ends up falling about 20 feet down this little gully, onto the rocks at the bottom. The dad climbed down and recovered the kid, but he'd fallen right on his head, and was dead by the time he got there. The baby was only about 15 months old. It was a total freak accident, a series of events that coalesced into the worst possible outcome. Probably one of the more awful calls I've been on. I honestly don't know how I'd forgotten this story, but it is by far the scariest thing that's happened to me. I guess maybe I've tried so long to forget about it that it just didn't come to mind right away. As someone who spends literally all of their time in the woods, you don't ever want to let yourself get scared of being alone or out in the middle of nowhere. That's why when you have experiences like this, you tend to just forget about them and move on. This is, to date, the only thing that's ever made me seriously consider if this job is the right one for me. I don't like talking about it much, but I'll do the best I can to remember it all. As I recall, this took place right at the end of spring. It was a typical lost child call. A four-year-old girl had wandered away from her family's campsite and had been missing for about two hours. Her parents were completely despondent and told us what most parents do. My kid would never wander away. She's so good about staying close. She's never done anything like this before. We assure the parents that we'll do everything we can to find her, and we spread out in a standard search formation. I was partnered with one of my good buddies, and we were sort of casually holding a conversation while we hiked. I know it sounds callous, but you do sort of become desensitized when you've done this long enough. It becomes the norm, and I think to a certain extent you have to learn to desensitize yourself to work this job. We search for a good two hours, going well beyond where we think she'd be and we come out of a small valley when something makes us both stop in unison. We freeze and look at each other, and there's almost a sensation like a plane depressurizing. My ears pop, and I have this odd sensation of having drop it about ten feet. I start to ask my buddy if he felt that, but before I can, we hear the loudest sound I've ever heard in my life. It's almost like a freight train passing directly by us, but it's coming from every direction at once, including above and below us. He screams something to me, but I can't hear him over this deafening roar. Understandably freaked out, we look all around us, trying to find the source of the sound, but neither of us sees anything. Of course, my first thought is a landslide, but we're not near any cliffs, and even if we were, it would have hit us by now. The sound goes on and on, and we're trying to yell at each other, but even standing close together, we can't hear anything but this sound. Then, as suddenly as it starts, it stops, like someone threw a switch and cut it off. We stand there for a second, perfectly still, and slowly the normal sounds of the woods come back. He asks me what the fuck just happened, but I just kind of shrug, and we stand there looking at each other for a minute. I get on the radio and ask if anyone else just heard the end of the fucking world, but no one else hears it, even though we're all within shouting distance of each other. My buddy and I just sort of shrug it off and keep going. About an hour later, we all check up on the radios, and no one's found the little girl. Most of the time we won't search when it gets dark, but because we don't have any kind of lead on her, a few of us decide to keep going, including me and my buddy. We keep close together, and we're calling out for her every couple of minutes. At this point, I'm hoping beyond hope that we find her, because while I may not like kids, the idea of them being out all alone in the dark is awful. The woods can be intimidating to kids in the daylight. At night, well, it's a whole different beast. But we're not seeing any signs of her or getting any responses, and around midnight, we decide to turn around and head back to the rendezvous point. We're about halfway back when my buddy stops and shines his light to the right of us into a really thick deadfall or group of dead trees. I ask him if he's heard a response, but he just tells me to be quiet for a second and listen. I do, and in the distance I can hear what sounds like a kid crying. We both call the girl's name and listen for any kind of response, but it's just this really faint crying. 
We head in the direction of this deadfall and go around it, calling her name over and over. As we get closer to the crying, I start getting this weird feeling in my gut, and I tell my buddy that something isn't right. He tells me he feels the same way, but we can't figure out what it is. We stop where we are and call the girl's name again, and at the same time, we both figure it out. The crying is on a loop. It's the same little hitching sob, then wail, then quiet hiccup, repeated over and over. It's exactly the same every time, and without saying another word, we both take off running. It's the only time I've ever lost my composure like that, but something about it was so incredibly wrong, and neither of us wanted to stay out there anymore. When we got back to the rendezvous, we asked if anyone else had heard anything strange, but no one else knew what we were talking about. I know it sounds sort of anticlimactic, but that call fucked me up for a long time. As for the little girl, we never found a trace of her. We keep an eye out for her and all the other people who we've never found, but frankly, I doubt we'll ever find anything. Of the missing persons calls I've gone out on, only a handful have ever resulted in a complete disappearance, meaning no trace of the person and no body ever found. But sometimes, finding a body just leads to more questions than answers. Here are some of the bodies we've found that have become infamous in our team. A teenage boy whose remains were recovered almost a year after he vanished. We've found the top of his skull, two finger bones, and his camera almost 40 miles from where he was last seen. The camera, sadly, was destroyed. The pelvis of an older man who had vanished a month earlier, that was all we found. The lower jaw and right foot of a two-year-old boy on the highest peak of a ridge in the southern part of the park. The body of a 10-year-old girl with Down syndrome, almost 20 miles from where she'd vanished. She had died of exposure three weeks after going missing, and all of her clothes were intact except for her shoes and jacket. There were berries and cooked meat in her stomach when they did the autopsy. The coroner said it appeared as if someone had been taking care of her. There were no suspects ever identified. The frozen body of a one-year-old baby, found a week after vanishing in the hollow trunk of a tree, ten miles from the area he was seen last. There was fresh milk found in his stomach, but his tongue was gone. A single vertebra and right kneecap of a three-year-old girl, found in the snow almost 20 miles from the campground, her family had been at the previous summer. Now on to a couple of the stories my friend told me. I mentioned that you were all interested in the stairs, and you're in luck. He's had a closer encounter with them. Though he doesn't have any explanation for them, he does have a bit more experience with them than I do. My buddy has been in search and rescue officer for about seven years. He started when he was a junior in college, and he had a very similar experience when he first encountered the stairs. His trainer told him almost the same thing mine did, which was to never go near, touch, or ascend them. For the first year he did just that, but apparently, his curiosity got the better of him, and on one call he broke away from the line and went to go check a set of them out. He said they were about ten miles from the path where a teenage girl had vanished, and the dogs were following a scent. He was on his own, lagging behind the main group, when he saw a set of stairs off to his left. They looked like they were from a new house, because the carpeting was pristine and white. He said that as he got closer, he didn't feel any different or hear any weird noises. He was expecting something to happen, like bleeding from his ears or collapsing. But he got right up next to them and didn't feel anything. The only thing he said that was odd was that there was absolutely no debris on the steps. No dirt, leaves, dust, anything. And there didn't appear to be any signs of animal or insect activity in the immediate area, which he found strange. It was less like things were avoiding them, and more like they just happened to be in a relatively barren part of the forest. He touched the stairs and didn't feel anything except that sort of sticky feeling you get from new carpet. Making sure his radio was on, he slowly climbed the stairs. He said it was terrifying because the way they'd been stigmatized, 
he wasn't really sure what was going to happen to him. He joked that half of him expected to be teleported to some other dimension, and the other half was watching for a UFO to come swooping down. But he got to the top with little event, and he stood there looking around. But, he said, the longer he stood on the top step, the more he felt like he was doing something very, very wrong. He described it as the feeling you'd get if you were in a part of a government building you have no business being in. As if someone was going to come and arrest you, or shoot you in the back of the head at any second. He tried to brush it off, but the feeling got stronger and stronger, and that's when he realized that he couldn't hear anything anymore. The sounds of the forest were gone and he couldn't hear his own breathing. It was like some kind of weird, awful tinnitus, but more oppressive. He climbed back down and rejoined the search, and didn't mention what he'd done. But, he said, the weirdest part came after. His trainer was waiting back at the welcome center after the search ended for the day, and he cornered my buddy before he could leave. He said his trainer had this look of intense anger, and he asked what was wrong. You went up them, didn't you? My buddy said it wasn't phrased as a question. He asked how his trainer knew. The trainer just shook his head. The trainer asked how long he'd been on the stairs, and my buddy said no more than a minute. The trainer gave him this really awful, almost dead-eyed look and told him that if he ever went up another set of stairs again, he'd be fired. Immediately. The trainer walked away, and I guess he's never answered any of the questions my buddy has asked him about it since. My buddy has been involved in a lot of missing persons cases where there's never been a trace of them found. I mentioned David Polites, and my buddy said he can confirm that those stories are, for the most part, accurate. He said that most of the time, if the person isn't found right away, they're either never found, or they're found weeks, months, or years later, in places they can't possibly have gotten to. One story he told me really stood out that involved a five-year-old boy with a severe mental disability. The little boy vanished from a picnic area in the late fall. In addition to the mental disability, he was also physically handicapped, and his parents explained over and over that he simply could not have vanished. It was impossible. Someone had to have taken him. My buddy said they searched for this kid for weeks going miles out of the accepted range, but it was like he'd never been there. The dogs couldn't pick up his scent anywhere not even in the picnic area where he'd vanished from. Suspicion fell on the parents, but it was pretty clear that they were devastated and hadn't done anything sinister to their kid. The search was concluded about a month later, and my buddy said everyone had pretty much forgotten it by later in the winter. He was out on a training op in the snow, on one of the higher peaks, when he came across something in the snow. He said he saw it from far away at first and when he got closer he realized it was a shirt, frozen and sticking part way out of the powder. He recognized it as belonging to the kid, because it had a distinctive pattern. About twenty yards away he found the kid's body, laying partially buried in the snow. My buddy said there was no way the kid had been dead for any more than a few days, even though he'd been missing for almost three months. The kid was curled around something, and when my buddy brushed off the snow to see what it was, he said he almost couldn't believe what he was seeing. It was a big chunk of ice that had been carved crudely to look sort of like a person. The kid was holding it so tight that it had frostbitten his chest and hands, which my buddy could tell even with the decay that had taken place. He radioed the rest of the crew, and they took the body off the mountain. Now, he recapped all of this for me, and to put it simply, there was no way this kid could have both survived for almost three months on his own, or have gotten to this peak. There was no physical way this child could have walked almost fifty miles and ended up on the top of a goddamn mountain. To top it off, there was nothing in the kid's stomach or colon. Nothing. Not even water. It was like, my buddy said, the kid had been taken off the face of the earth, put in suspended animation, and dropped on this mountain months later only to die of exposure. He's never really gotten over that one.
The last story I'll share from him was one that took place relatively recently, only a few months ago. They were out doing a recon for mountain lions because there had been several reports of sightings in the last couple of days. One of our jobs is to scout out the areas where these animals are seen to ensure that if they are in the area, we can warn people and close off those trails. He was out on his own in a very heavily forested part of the park toward dusk when he heard what sounded like a woman screaming in the distance. Now, as most of you know, when a mountain lion screams, it sounds almost exactly like a woman being brutally murdered. It's unsettling, but far from abnormal. My buddy radioed back and let Ops know that he'd heard one, and that he was going to keep going to see if he could figure out where its territory started. He heard the mountain lion scream a couple more times, always from the same spot, and determined the approximate area of the mountain lion's territory. He was about to head back when he heard another scream, this time within only a few yards of him. Of course, he freaks out and starts heading back at a much faster pace because the last thing he wants is to run into a goddamn mountain lion and get mauled to death. As he got back on the path and started heading back, the screaming followed him, and he broke into a jog. When he was about a mile from Ops, the screaming stopped and he turned around to see if it was following him. It was almost night by this point, but he said in the distance, just before the path rounded a corner, he could see what looked like a male figure. He called out to them, warning them that the paths were closed and that he needed to come back to the welcome center. The figure just stood there, and my buddy started to walk over. When he was about ten yards away, the figure took, as he described, an impossibly long step toward him and let out the same scream my buddy had been hearing. My buddy didn't even say anything. He just turned and sprinted back to Ops, never looking behind him. By the time he got back, the screaming had moved back into the woods. He didn't mention it to anyone else, just said that there was a mountain lion in the area and that they would need to close those paths until the animal could be located and moved. I'm going to end this video here. I'm going to be heading out on a yearly training op tomorrow morning so I'll be gone until early next week. I'll be meeting with a lot of former trainers and buddies who work in other areas of the park, and I'll be asking around about any stories they'd like to share. I'm so glad you guys have been interested in my stories, and once I'm back from this op, I'll continue to share them. Let me know in the YouTube comments if you want to hear more search and rescue stories. Also, let me know what you think the mysterious stairs are for. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. What time is it? I don't know. I did know. It was 11.55 p.m. I lose motivation to talk properly when I'm tired, although this was definitely an overreaction. At most, it would have taken an extra second to tell him the time. But I wasn't really thinking. I just wanted to get home, ignoring all social interactions. I didn't even look up to see this man's face. He left without saying anything, limping as he walked, leaving me alone at the bus stop, waiting for the final departure of the night. A single minute past midnight was the usual time on the schedule, although it's almost always late, despite only ever having a few passengers at most. My late shift at work had me used to these empty hours of the night. This specific part of town lacked in nightlife entertainment leaving little reason to be out after dark. The shops were long closed, waiting for the bustling environment of the next morning. Until then, they remained silent. Some had their lights on all night long, spilling echoes of life into an otherwise inactive street. If the rapture occurred with me at this bus stop, it would take a long while for that news to reach me, as I simply continue waiting for an ever later never arriving bus. These are the kind of thoughts I have as I wait in the dark for the bus. The occasional breaks in these thoughts are often caused by me checking the digital sign above me, displaying an estimated time for all upcoming departures. Expecting to see five minutes, or perhaps a more delayed ten minutes, I hadn't planned on having to read a whole sentence. 
So, as I finished checking the sign, only then did my mind realize that it had not even seen a number. I had checked the sign, but did not comprehend the content. My double take showed me what I had missed. The next bus is not real. Do not board. I stared for a moment before looking around. What I expected to see, I do not know. Perhaps some pranksters giggling at their work. Or more sinisterly, a shadowy figure looming over to guide this paranormal event. Nothing. I saw nothing. The same street I had become familiar with had nothing new. It remained empty, with me as its only sign of life. So, I waited. It was 11.59 p.m. by this point, so only two more minutes remained. On time for what may have been the first time ever, the bus arrived, a single minute past midnight. And here it was, pulling around the corner, approaching the stop. I put my hand out to signal my need to board, feeling relieved that my only way home hadn't been canceled. As the bus approached, I noticed the dark interior. The headlights were on, but the lights inside were all off. I could not make out whether any passengers were on board or even who the driver was. Being a regular, I know most of the final route drivers. But this time, it was anybody's guess. I got onto the bus, putting down the same change I always do. Bit dark, isn't it? Nobody replied as the doors closed behind me and the bus continued its way forward. I smiled awkwardly, despite knowing that the driver could not see me and found a seat. I never found out whether there were any more passengers, but I can only hope that nobody else had to go through these next events. Almost immediately, I noticed stops being omitted from the route. A turn missed here, a completely wrong turn taken there. A panic set in that I had somehow gotten onto the wrong bus, despite knowing for a fact that the bus I always get is the only local one that runs this late. Convincing myself that an unfortunate series of road closures had occurred, I remained calm and waited it out. After 10 minutes of this, we had circled back to the stop I had boarded at. In front of us, I noticed a more normal bus, the bus I was supposed to board. The lights were on with a few passengers. It was waiting at the stop. I spoke slightly louder than the rumble of the engine. Excuse me, can I get off? I'm on the wrong bus. No answer as we slowly passed the correct bus. I could see the passengers inside all staring ahead. My gaze followed theirs, meeting at an ambulance parked just slightly in front. A small group of paramedics knelt down in the beam of the bus headlights, surrounding a body on the floor. I couldn't make out the body's face, as it was just out of sight, although one leg looked twisted. The passengers looked distraught, whilst the bus driver stood talking to the paramedics. I stood up. I need to leave at the next stop. As I spoke, I pressed the bell, and the only sign of any internal lights lit up at the front of the bus. Stopping. The sign then immediately turned off. Subsequent bell presses neither made the sound nor lit up the sign. I need to... The bus sped up suddenly, the force pushing me back into my seat. As I tried to stand up again, the wheels screeched as we turned a sharp corner without seeming to slow down at all. Again, the force pushed me back down. The speed continued to rise. The wheels on the bus went faster and faster until the outside world became simply a blur. I had never seen a car go this fast, let alone a road vehicle as large as this. I thought for sure that I was going to die, right there. What are you doing? I found myself yelling out amid the panic. The driver, for the first and last time, spoke. I don't know. My mind raced almost as fast as my body was being thrown about. The world beyond the windows soon morphed into a void of black, although the effects of our speed were still evident on my body, as the velocity pushed me in all directions. It felt as though we had somehow gotten even faster, 
although this may have been the darkness forbidding my eyes of any reference for our true speed, we came to a sudden stop as I fell forward. The fall was violent, but still not as bad as you'd expect for a speed change of that magnitude. My nose hit the floor, causing a great deal of pain. I stood up, holding my face, trying to regain my balance. As the dizziness subsided, I began to notice where I was. We were outside my home. The bus stop I get off at is a five-minute walk from here. Yet here we were, directly outside my house. The doors gently opened. Despite my desire to leave as fast as possible, I found myself walking to the front of the bus. As I reached the door, I stopped, turning around slowly to face the still shrouded in darkness bus driver I spoke what I always do. Thank you. I stepped onto the pavement outside as the doors closed behind me, followed by the bus driving forward into the darkness. I looked down at my watch. A minute past midnight. 